Today's podcast is sponsored by my new favorite animated TV show, Tuttle Twins, the first cartoon series to teach kids principles of freedom, economics, and liberty, and to be funny in the process. Nowadays, hidden political agendas are constantly forced on your kids in entertainment and in schools. Tuttle Twins is a hilarious cartoon series that teaches kids about the principles of freedom without being overly preachy. It's educational and hilarious, and there are lots of jokes for adults too. The best part? You can watch Tuttle Twins entirely for free. Just go to TuttleTwins.tv, that is TuttleTwins, T-U-T-T-L-E, T-W-I-N-S dot TV, and over there you can watch all of the episodes for free. One more time, that's TuttleTwins.tv. Highly recommend it. Go check it out. What's up, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls around the world? I would like to welcome you back to the Real Talk with Zuby podcast. Today's special guest is Derek Sloan. He is the leader of the Ontario Party in Canada. Welcome to the show, Derek. How are you doing? Hey, good. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. I've done a brief intro right there, Derek, but for people who are not familiar with you, please tell them who you are and what you're all about. Sure. So I'm a Canadian citizen. I uh, I was a federal member of parliament, uh, so a member of parliament at the national stage here in Canada for, for several years. Uh, I was with the mainstream party, the Conservative Party of Canada. I ran for leader of that party as well. I was eventually ejected from that party for being too vocal and and uh, forthright about some of the issues relating to COVID-19 and, and other issues as well. And uh, since that time, I have taken over leadership of a non-mainstream party in our largest province of Ontario, and we are running for the uh, the provincial election that's coming up in just a few weeks. So we have candidates all across Ontario, which is our province of 15 million people, so the largest province in Canada. And uh, we're trying to take our country back, starting with our largest province. I hear that. When you say you're trying to take the country back, what do you mean by that? Well, we've we've seen a uh, a failure in in democracy in this country. We we've, we've seen the destruction of uh, of constitutional rights over the last two years, without you know barely a squeak of protests from our main institutions. Um, it's been mainly people on the ground that have been uh, you know protesting and disputing what's going on. We saw some of the longest lockdowns and school closures in the world in our province here in Ontario. And we want to uh, get our province back. We want to get some integrity. We want to get some um, transparency back into government. And the government from the last two years has basically been, uh, you know, I- I- immune to uh, the the needs of the average person. And it's time for a change. I hear that. Now, as someone who is a Canadian and, of course, who is involved in the political realm there, a question I've had and which a lot of people, I think, have been wondering over the past couple of years is why certain countries went so crazy with this all. In particular, if you're talking about the Western world, Canada, Australia, and New Zealand uh, seem to have not just the most authoritarian approaches for the most part, but it also seemed like and does still seem like a significant percentage of the population is has been in support of that. Um, that's something that certainly took me to by surprise to, to some degree to see these, <laughs> these nations going full authoritarian. And I know many Canadians who are not happy with it, but it seems that Canada of all of the countries seems to have been one of the places, not just in the West, but actually in the entire world that had the most authoritarian approach to this. Um, as far as I'm aware, there are still parts of Canada where, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm here in, in the UK as I record this and everything's been dropped. There's absolutely nothing. You don't even need a test to fly into the country. Uh, you don't even need to isolate if you test positive. Um, but Canada has had a very different approach. Why, why do you think that is? You know, it's a good question. I, I think it's part of it has to do with the ineptitude of our leaders and part of it has to do with the, you know, the trust, the trustworthy nature of our citizens. So, you know, by and large, Canada has had, um, you know, uh, a fairly well government, uh, you know, since its inception. And, um, you know, Canadian citizens are largely trustworthy. If, if you know, their government says, uh, you know, something they, you know, the average Canadian believes it. Um, 
our leadership, of course, has been very poor. It's been what I call lowest common denominator leadership. So, you know, they've certainly not uh, uh, excelled in their, uh, you know, compared to their peers in terms of trying new things. They only they only kind of did uh, things when everyone else was doing it. And the, you know, uh, the lowest common denominator approach is basically just, you know, lock down, stay home, pray for a better day. So it is true that we still have mandates at the federal level. You can't even get on a plane in this country unless you're vaccinated. So, uh, yeah, there's some very uh, interesting things going on, but it's tough to know what happened. But the fact is, is that there was an absolute failure of leadership. And that's why we need a new, uh, new slate of leaders here in this country. I hear that. Is that something that, I mean, obviously you're running, so you must believe it, but how much do you feel there is an, there's an appetite for that in, in Canada? Cause Trudeau just recently got reelected, correct? Yeah. So Trudeau did get reelected. He, he got reelected with, I think the fewest votes in history, uh, uh, uh to do so. It was a very low percentage, but, uh, and he got, you know, elected as a minority government. Um, you know, part of the issue is that, you know, um, at the, you know, it, it take it takes a while for people to to people right now have there's there's an ever increasing number of people who hate all the options, and I mm -hmm. think that's a first step to trying something new. So there's a lot of people who don't like anybody, and uh, and you know, starting new movements, starting new parties gives people a, a, an option at the at the polls. So we're going to make sure that people have that option in this upcoming election. And uh, hopefully they they d decide to choose that. I hear that. So what is that got you into politics in the first place? How long have you been in it? So I've been in the political sphere for for, you know, about four years or so. Um, in terms of officially involved, I've been interested in politics for longer than that. Um, you know, for me, it was really I, you know, I never grew up wanting to be a politician, but I just was seeing, um, you know, the destruction of free speech the 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 weaponization of politics and i was in actually law school at the time and you know they were basically teaching us to be political activists instead of instead of lawyers and i found that troubling because you know you know obviously my classmates 10 20 years down the road would be the ones who are you know sitting on the benches as as judges so uh, it really concerned me to see that my peers were not you know didn't have the same beliefs about free speech as you know you and i do um, they were really into uh, pushing their own kind of utopian agenda uh, uh, when it comes to, you know, their, you know, what it was that they wanted to do. So this is this is what scared me. This is what drew me into politics. And that's why I'm still here. I hear that. So in terms of your own campaign and your own ideas and policies, what are some of the major components of it? What are the messages that you want to get across for why people should support you? Yeah. So we're taking a, a hard stance against the mandates. We're saying that, you know, we will we will end any mandates. We will prevent them from happening again. And we will launch inquiries into, you know, uh, we have a Charter of Rights and Freedoms in Canada. So into mm -hmm. abuses of that constitutional document. Um, anybody who was fired or kicked out of school for vaccine non-compliance, we want to make sure that they're rehired with back pay or, you know, brought back to school with, with uh, a chance to make up for lost time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're against tyranny. Uh, uh, the digital ID is something that uh, our government wants to bring in. And we're against anything that would give the government the framework and the infrastructure to do what they're doing in China, where they have, you know, like a social credit system and a surveillance state. So we're fighting against that. We're fighting against indoctrination in our school system where, you know, kids are being taught, um, you know, age inappropriate sex education. They're, they're being taught subjective uh, values at a young age about sexuality. They're being taught in some cases, uh, various iterations of kind of critical race theory where, um, you know, people based on uh, what they look like are either oppressed or, or oppressing um, and things like this. So we want to bring get indoctrination out of the education system mm -hmm. and uh, make sure that we're teaching students, uh, you know, ABCs, reading, writing and arithmetic and things like this. Mm -hmm. We also want to make sure that we're promoting free speech on our campuses and um, 
uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, forcing our colleges and universities that receive public funding to make sure that they're not uh, promoting their own political agendas. Got it. What do you think that's happened, Derek, not just in your country, but also in the US, in across the entire Anglosphere world, where we seem to be reaching this point where standing up for liberal values has become a conservative position. How have we gotten here? I mean, you're talking about free speech, liberty, not having forced mandates and forced vaccinations, uh, not discriminating against people, telling people to judge each other as individuals rather than by their race or their gender or their sexuality and so on and so forth. Aren't these fundamentally Western liberal values, I mean, by the proper definition of the word, what's happened where it seems that the parties and individuals who call themselves liberal and who like to use that term have over time, in some ways, actually become <laughs> extraordinarily conservative in some in some ways, um, and then just totally off the hinges in others, because uh, it's, it's a pattern I've observed, and it seems very backwards. Yeah, you know, I think what it is is that uh, um, the, the the mainstream political parties or politics generally has become about the the crass uh, uh, use of power. So mm. the only thing, um, you know, the the politics generally has degraded. So we don't have um, the heroes that that we used to have. You know, we don't have Abraham Lincoln's. We don't have Winston Churchill's. We don't have uh, you know people who are in politics for the right reasons. And so the the parties will do anything that they think they need to do to maintain their power. And if that means, you know, pandering to one group over another, if that means, you know, pitting one group against, against another to to gain power, then so be it. And so when you're when you're only you know preaching to the choir, like so for example, you know, Justin Trudeau here uh, has a kind of a, a loose coalition of, of you know, center left uh, and left leaning voters, along with, you know, some traditional liberals who just haven't clued in yet. And so basically what he wants to do is he wants to rile them up against the quote unquote extremists on the other side mm -hmm. and bait them and 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 do whatever he can to trample those other people, even though those other people are also citizens of Canada. So instead of trying to govern and lead everybody, they just want to, you know, pit their coalition against another and try and, you know, trample that other, you know, the opposing coalition under their foot as best mm -hmm. as they can. That's, that's sort of what they want to do. There's just been a, de a general degradation in values and principles and, you know, liberties and rights suffer uh, uh, in that context. Mm. What do you think should be the proper role of the government? Because a, a big question I've been I guess, diving back in on a lot over the last two years, especially, and reanalyzing is just this, the nature between this relationship between governments and the general citizens, because that's something that has went completely out of whack over the last two years under the guise of health and safety and security, right? Those words basically became the the banner under which you could put forward any type of um any type of di any type of outright you know, discrimination or even segregation all sorts of force all types of authoritarian tyrannical um honestly ccp style tactics and policies and and again seeing this happen in places like the uk canada parts of the us Australia, New Zealand, Western Europe, so-called bastions of liberty and freedom. I think it struck me especially hard because, uh, you know, I grew up in Saudi Arabia, right? I didn't grow up in a so-called liberal democracy. So I've seen different ways that countries can be run. And obviously you see the, the way things are done differently around the world. And the thing that always stood out about the Western world is that you are supposed to have this democracy. You're supposed to have liberty and individual rights and certain uh, rights and freedoms that, you know, civil liberties that, that the government does not trample upon. But it seems like in the light of this one particular virus, hundreds of millions of people 
not just people in politics, but even just everyday people were, were so willing and quick and eager to throw that all in the trash under the guise of, you know, supposedly not wanting to get sick or supposedly wanting to uh, protect people or for the greater good or any other type of slogan. And it's made me just honestly, it's, it's made me feel like the whole thing is a facade. I mean, if it can all be snatched away as under the uh, guise of a so-called emergency, and then you can extend those emergency powers for as long as you want, then how is that different from a dictatorship? Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, we've, we saw the same failure in our, our own country as well. I mean, we have a charter of rights and freedoms that at face value should protect mm -hmm. us from this. And it didn't, you know, and there's reasons for that. In, in you know, in like, if, for example, our court, our, you know, it takes a while to, to get constitutional cases through the court system and, and things like this. But at the end of the day, it's like, well, you know, what what good is the document? What good are the, are the courts if they can't protect us? Mm -hmm. And, you know, frankly, you know, my belief on all of this is um, there's no document, there's no, you know, theory, there's no, uh, you know, court system that is going to protect us as citizens in, in, in these countries. The only thing that's going to protect us is good people who are in positions mm -hmm. of power. That's it. Um, you know, I mean, you know, a, a charter of rights and freedoms, is that helpful? Sure. You know, is, is talking about the rightful place of government good? Sure. All of that is 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 good. But without, uh, you know, honest and moral people in government, we have no hope. And that's what, uh, you know, that's 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 my life's mission is to kind of reinvigorate the institutions and the political process in this country to make mm. sure that we have good people at every single level of government that, uh, you know, are there for the right reasons. I think that's something that everybody wants. In in practice, though, how do we how how do we make that how do we make that happen? Um, I guess maybe this is a, a, a multiple part question. Is number one, who how do we uh, know who's uh, who is good and who's moral and who's righteous? I mean, I, I still to this day know people who think that Justin Trudeau is this wonderful uh, <laughs> this 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 wonderful uh, champion of equality and diversity and kindness and tolerance because that's how he puts himself across. Um, I obviously don't agree with that position, but I know people who seem to genuinely believe that, um, and they're not stupid. Um, and then part two, even if you have people who are genuinely decent how do you avoid the corruption of the of the political system how do people who are decent stay in that and not become the monsters that they want to take take on because i i do believe that uh i like to try to believe that most people in general in this world have good intentions um but there does seem to be something about this the, the system itself i don't know exactly what it's like in canada but certainly in the us and in the uk it's just, it's just, it's just messy, and there's so much corruption, and I don't know how deep the whole rabbit hole goes, but um, I think a lot of good and decent moral people are put off by politics, not because they don't want to uh, help and support their fellow citizens, but just because they just don't want to get involved in that whole, in that whole world. Well, I think there's a couple of things going on. And, you know, we have a similar problem to what you've said in, in terms of, you know, yeah, there's, you know, a lot of people enter politics with good intentions. Um, in our country, one of the major issues that we're facing is the the uh, kind of mainstream parties need to go. Um, okay. if, you know, if, if you're a, um, you know, a member of a mainstream party, you have very little say unless you're at the very top of that party. So uh, the, uh, even though like in our House of Commons, we have 338 uh, members in, in the House, um, really only three or four people decide what goes on there. Basically, the leaders of the of the different parties that make up, you know, make up those seats. So we need to get to a point where, uh, you know, the, the parties are basically either there's new parties that take their place or the, these other parties are basically rebuilt from the ground up because there is not. Uh, you know, true freedom and democracy. The, the, you know, free votes don't really exist uh, in in our parliament, and I think it's I think they're rare. Uh, you know, in other places as well. Um, but you know, there's too much you know whipping of votes and forcing people to do things. So you know, we when need you, to when you say free. Sorry, when you say free votes, what do you mean by that? So most people in our parliament here in Canada uh, basically kind of have to vote along party line. 
So whatever bill that's coming up for debate, 99 times out of 100, everybody is voting along party lines. So all the liberals vote one way, all the conservatives vote one way. You know, um, that's a problem. The mm -hmm. only the leaders of these parties are deciding what these people are doing. And if they step out of line too much, they'll get ejected from the party. And that's what's happened to me. That's what's happened to some other people who, you know, just don't know how to play ball. No, mm -hmm. you know, don't know how to, you know, whatever the English equivalent is, don't know how to, you know, get on the pitch or whatever the game is, <laughs> whatever the uh, phrase is. Um, so, you know, it, it, there's a major sort of pressure, you know, uh, uh, explicit and, and, and implicit to play ball. Uh, and that doesn't necessarily, I, I'm not saying everybody's taking bribes or anything like that, but they just know that their career in politics outside of a mainstream party is, is, is almost impossible. It's almost mm -hmm. impossible for an average person to win as an independent. So they just play the game. If the government wants to lock everybody down, they're not going to make a big stink about it. So, that's what we have here in this country uh, to one degree or another that exists in other places as well. Mm -hmm. But that's why we need new parties that are very strict about, you know, free votes. You know, if you're elected to represent, you know, your riding, your constituents, you have to represent them. You can't just do whatever your leader and his, you know, unelected consultants, you know, the, the, the direction of all these parties is basically the leader and a bunch of kind of unelected people that you don't know who they are behind the scenes, you know, consultants or whatever, kind of forming the game, the game plan. Mm -hmm. We need to have our, our members of parliament actually involved in the process in, in more than just a surface fashion. And unfortunately, that's what that's the issue that we have to answer your other question where you were talking about. Well, you know, how are we how do people know who's good and all this? Mm -hmm. You know, I, frankly, at the end of the day, you have to trust people. Um, meaning citizens, you have to trust citizens to have the discernment. And, you know, I, I believe personally, yes, there's always going to be people who, who like Justin Trudeau or who like, you know, whoever, but most people right now are not as involved as you are in mm -hmm. politics. And my guess is your friends that like Justin Trudeau, very few of them, you know, actually know what's going on in parliament. So we need to get people, uh, you know, for every Zuby out there, there's probably, a, you know, a thousand people your age who are not paying attention to politics, maybe 10,000. Mm -hmm. And we need to, you know, get, get people engaged in the process. Cause a lot of people have checked out and they don't trust anybody. So yes. we need to get people engaged in the process again. What do you think is the best way to, to win that trust from those apathetic people? Because I think that's an important and, uh, you know, a, a perhaps majority demographic that's largely ignored in these conversations whenever people are talking about politics, they tend to kind of split it along these binary lines. And I don't know what percentage of people vote in Canada, but there's many places where the majority or around half the adult population doesn't even doesn't participate at all. They don't they don't even vote. I know it's mandatory in Australia. Um, I don't think it is in Canada. Um, but how do you get those people involved? Because you know, I think most people want to mostly be left alone and not have things fall apart and be relatively safe and secure. I think regardless of how people describe their politics, in truth, I think that's what, you know, 70, 80 percent of people mostly want. Maybe they have a couple other grievances that they want dealt with. But I just think most people would like to like to me, politics is doing its job and the government is doing its job when I don't notice it. Right. When, when I'm not when, when, when like I'm, I'm not thinking about it, it's not on my brain, I'm not seeing much, whatever. It's just I can get on with my life and I'm not being impeded. Right. Over the past two years, it's just been constant interference. Uh, this restriction, that restriction, this mandate, that mandate. Right. Like stopping people from doing the basic things they want to do, going outside, seeing their friends, seeing their family, going to the gym, running their business, just doing their normal stuff. Um, that that's that's been prevented for such a long time and that's why so many people have been unhappy and then of course the people who support those policies get mad at those who don't because they they'll claim they're putting other people in danger and whatnot but how do you how do you win that trust back because I, I think we're probably at an all-time high of distrust not just in the political system but in many corporations 
uh, in the media, in the traditional corporate media, there's so much distrust now because it's just been, you know, a, a, one thing followed by another, followed by another, followed by another. And um, yeah, I just think a lot of people are checked out, as you said. Yeah, I think um, I think uh, when when good leaders present themselves, the people can 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 read them. They can they can sense genuine integrity and honesty. And so, um, you know, I think we're going to I, I, I think by having th those options available, we can we can do well. And, you know, a lot of people, again, they if you take a look, the only parties that have a, a play in an election are the mainstream parties. The leadership races of these parties are basically to one degree or another managed. So you're never going to get it would be almost impossible um, for like a Winston Churchill or, or, or something like that to to sort of win a, a, a leadership race in, in this day and age, in my view. So that's why. Well, I have why do you th why do you think that is? Well, there's just too many. Um, there's too many factions. There's too many politically correct hoops to kind of jump through to get uh, the, you know, the support, you know, you kind of, um, to use an example in Canada right now, we're, we're having a leadership race for our federal conservative party. So that's, you know, our, uh, our mainstream, you know, just as likely to hold government next time as anybody else uh, party. And they just ejected two candidates from the race who raised, raised their money, met all the rules for some undefined reason, but the real reason is they just didn't like the cut of their jib, right? They didn't like, they didn't like who they were. These were people who were fighting for freedom, who were in favor of the truckers convoy. And, you know, they just didn't like that. They, they didn't like it. And, you know, these slimy back, you know, backseat people that kind of run things behind the scenes in these parties, they axed them. They came up with some weird rule. They axed them. So I think that, you know, for anybody with, you know, impeachable integrity, unimpeachable integrity, to kind of make it through the system without, you know, soiling themselves and without getting canceled by the other mm. sort of nasties that are behind the scenes would be very unlikely and challenging. So that's why I feel like, you know, somebody like a Winston Churchill or, or you know, an honest Abe or something like that would have a very difficult time. And, and plus, in this day and age, you have to be in favor of all kinds of immoral things to get anywhere. You know, you have to love abortion and you have to, you know, love all this stuff, you know, to get the, the check marks from the, you know, the media and other things. So it, it's just very challenging, but, but again, that's why we're, we're doing, we're starting a brand new party. We're unashamedly, uh, you know, standing for all of these things. And, mm -hmm. and I believe that, you know, with just a little bit of time, we can make great inroads into politics here. I think it's so interesting what you said there, because what does it say about the population? If those are the things that you need to support and compromise on in order to stand a chance. I mean, a, a question I ask myself often, uh, I asked this actually on Twitter a while ago and it raised a lot of interesting conversation is, do, do countries get the leaders they deserve? It's something I flip flop on. Um, sometimes I'm like, yes, absolutely. Sometimes I'm like, mm, no. Um, but particularly if you're in a country with a democratic process where you've got voting, you could make a strong argument that ultimately people, you know, people get the the leaders and the policies that they that they want and that they support. Um, I see this in especially if I look in somewhere like uh, California in the USA, where things have just been declining and declining and getting worse and worse by very many measures. And then last year, they had an opportunity to, you know, recall their governor and change things. And they overwhelmingly voted in favor of keeping him. And then those same people will then go and complain about complain about the problems, complain about the, uh, you know, the drug addicts all over the place and feces on the road and human beings sleeping in tents all over and very high taxes and terrible schooling and so on and so forth. But it's like, well, you voted for it. So. I don't know. At some point, I become a little bit despondent, and I'm like, "Well, I, I I don't know. Like, how how much do you? It's such it's such a strange uphill battle. It seems sometimes because I think over the past ten years, especially, I really think that there's been a a weird form of moral decay in in the Western world, and it seems to me like a spiritual problem more than a a political problem.
And I don't know if you can solve a spiritual problem with a political solution. I think that we keep trying this over and over again, but I'm like, man, there's something, there's something deep at the heart of these, of these countries and these cultures, which is, has gone, has gone strange. Um, I mean, when, when you're having arguments for multiple years about whether or not men can menstruate and get pregnant and give birth, your society's in trouble. Yeah, I think there, they show, show, so you're right. Fundamentally, this is a spiritual problem. And the reason that we've seen a decay in, you know, our government and our values and all that is because we have, uh, ele- we've let the, you know, the, the Christian values that have, that were used to found this country and other Western countries he wrote, um, that's not something that is necessarily solved by politics. In fact, it's not technically, but we do need good leaders that can lead from the top, not just pander to, you know, the lowest common denominator. But mm. beyond that, I do believe that there is an elite group of people in the media and politics that are actively pushing uh, dangerous and negative agendas and are oh, actively, sure. um, you know, like when I was saying that you had to be in favor of all this stuff, it's not even necessarily that the average person is clamoring for that all the time. It's more just that if you don't, then the media paints you as a monster. And then, you know, people in your party start getting nervous and then they they look for ways to put a knife in your back. Um, so it's kind of, it, it happens more at the elite level than it does on, on the average level. And mm-hmm. I think that a lot of people have been um, betrayed and, and basically fed a lot of lies from their leaders, especially about COVID, but, but more than just COVID. And, you know, I think that Canadians deserve and, and other people deserve a real choice. They deserve to know the facts and they deserve to choose on the facts. And I think that I think that Canadians and others should have, you know, had a little bit more discernment in, in choosing their leaders. But in their defense, a lot of times they don't really have a lot of good options. And one option isn't that much better than or worse than the other than the next. And so, you know. That's why we want to found, you know, we're starting options here in in Canada that are, you know, those unimpeachable options. And if we try for 30 years and fail, well, then I guess we can blame it on, you know, the population. But <laughs> let's, you know, let's give them a chance and let's uh, try and, and, you know, sh- give them the facts. I hear that. Uh, stepping away from what we've been talking about, um, I'm curious to know how, what led you to your views and beliefs themselves. Um, I know that you, you work in law. I know that you're a husband. I know that you're a a father. Um, were you someone who was raised as a conservative or how have you, what's led you to your socio-political and cultural positions that's even brought you to this place? Yeah. So my, my family, my parents have always run, run their own business. Um, so I was raised in a, in a home where, you know, um, you know, the money didn't just show up in your bank account at the end of the month. Like you actually had Mm -hmm. to work for it. And, and, you know, everything that you earned was basically your, your own. Um, so it wasn't just that, you know, you had a paycheck and, and it was, you know, you know, we had to pay for the dentist. We had to, you know, the idea of having all these benefits and all that just wasn't, you know, in our home because, you know, my parents were small business owners. We didn't really talk politics in uh, like from a partisan standpoint. We weren't members of a party, but we were certainly, you know, kind of small C conservative uh, uh, in that sense. And and so I always, um, you know, a, a sense of hard work and all this was instilled in me. And 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 also, I think I was just born as a person who believes strongly that anybody can basically be whatever they want. And I just had this sense that, you know, as humans, we just have a, you know, a strong sense of freedom to, you know, to, to control our destinies. You know, I, 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 this idea that, you know, uh, the government has to do this or that for me, or, 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 you know, I need a a program or I need this. That's just not something that, you know, kind of, it's just not who I am. It's not sort of how I, I kind of came out of the womb, sort of punching and kicking, so to speak. And, and I'm just the kind of guy that believes uh, you know, b- believes that, you know, if, if you want to get something done, then go ahead and do it, you know, like, so that's kind of me, but in terms of my, you know, where I'm at today, it, it really, for me, everything, everything comes to, uh, comes down to, to my faith, my faith in Jesus Christ, basically. 
Um, I had a, a conversion experience when I was about 18 years old. And um, again, you know, conversion experience is is one of those things that just kind of defies description. But, you know, I was uh, I'd been raised going to church and stuff like that, but I, I was never really serious about it. And, you know, just one day uh, uh, I was listening to I was at a, an event where there was, uh, you know, an evangelist that was reading from the Bible and it just something, you know, beyond description that I can't explain but I just, you know, he was talking about, you know, reading from the Bible, you know, how when Jesus comes again, we're going to have to stand before God and account for what we've done. And, you know, just it wasn't any, you know, one thing, but it, but the series of meetings I was at, it just the, the idea that I would have to stand before God was just impressed on me in a way that, you know, defies description. Um, I I didn't ask for it. I didn't. You know, but but there's something to be said about, you know, the Bible is an inspired book, in my view. And there's something about hearing inspired words from the Bible that that, you know, cut to the core of who you are. And during this experience, I just knew that I would have to stand before God and account. And it's something that I just knew it. Uh, you know, like, how do you know the sky is blue? How do you know that your mother loves you? How do you I mean? It was just something that just it, it was more than logic. It was just something that I just knew. And I was frankly scared. Like I just mm. knew it. I knew it beyond a shadow of a doubt. I, I couldn't argue with it. I didn't want to believe it, but I just knew it. I was I was convicted. And it's it's a supernatural thing that, that can happen to you. It's it's happened to many other people, but it's just one of those things. I I think I think deep down we we all know that there's something more out there. And that just hit me really hard. And I just knew that I would have to account for my time here on earth. Mm -hmm. And frankly, um, you know, I was living more of a frivolous life at that time. And a period of, you know, months and, and so on of deep soul searching and, uh, you know, you know, struggle led me to the life I live today, where I honestly, every day, I act as one that must give account. And, and I don't do anything unless I think that it's something that's honorable and that will give me, you know, that, that, that could, you know, whether someone's watching or not, these are the kinds that that's how I live my life, you know, and, and frankly, it's, it's made all the difference in the world to me. Uh, you know, life has, life has meaning, you know, I'm not really that worried about the, you know, day to day, you know, friction and oscillation. I mean, people have said, you know, lots of people love me, but a lot of people have said many, you know, nasty things about me. Of course. I, you know, for me, I just know I'm doing what God has called me to do. And it's a very, uh, you know, freeing and exciting opportunity. And I, um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't change it for the world. I mean, I have, I have every freedom to not do what I'm doing. I could do anything mm -hmm. else, but, uh, for me, I just really love what I'm doing. God has called me to do this. And I've seen so many doors open. Um, the fact that I'm even here where I am with, you know, kind of a national voice in Canada is a miracle. And many points along the way, running for leadership of the mainstream parties and and and, and other things, have, have been miracles and doors have opened. But you know, the other thing on that point is that you know, for me, I I have a I have a foundation that's that's you know built built on built on a rock, and whatever the day to day oscillations are, you know, I know what's right, and and whether it's comfortable or not, I want to stand up for you know, the voiceless. I want to stand up for, um, you know, babies in the womb. I want to stand up for, um, you know, children. I want to stand up for, you know, many different issues, whether it's uh, uh, politically convenient or not. And this kind of, you know, steadfastness, I believe only only comes through God. It's nothing that I've done, but we need people of, of character and, take, and integrity that aren't going to bow and bend to you know the winds uh, the winds of politics as they come and go and that's 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 what i have to offer and there's a whole generation uh that we're raising up that's going to have that same principle amen i love to hear that derek it's been amazing talking to you i wish you <clears throat> so much luck in your endeavors i hope you're able to make a dent over there in ontario i think the message that you are talking about is more necessary now than ever and it's good to know that there is, are some canadians out there who are fighting for liberty and fighting for decency and fighting for morality and who have that conviction because i wish more people had it 
Well, really appreciate it. And thank you so much for having me on today. Nice one. Last thing before we go, where can people find you online and learn more about what you're doing? Yeah. So, so uh, the best place is uh, so they can go to my web, my website, which is uh, www.derricksloan.ca, or they can go to www.ontarioparty.ca, which is uh, uh, the, the party website for what we're doing right now. Awesome. Thank you, Derek. Glad to be here. Thank you.